Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew's Gospel, the 21st chapter, verses 33 through 46. And it says this, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants then seized his servants. They beat one, they killed another, and stoned the third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated these servants the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come on, let's kill him and we'll take his inheritance. So they took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes. What will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew that he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. May God add his blessing to our reading of his word. Well, as you're tuning into this, it's October. Can you believe that? It's already October. Uh, October means that it's only a couple of more months until Christmas. I can't believe that Christmas is this close. So I thought I'd start today uh, by telling a Christmas story. There's a, a poem. Well, it started as a poem, then it became a song. It was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The name of the song is I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It was written in 1863 by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Wadsworth Longfellow was born in Portland, Maine in 1807. He grew up, 
did okay. He wrote, he studied, he became a professor. And by all means, he would have appeared to have been a successful uh, person. He was at one time called the most popular poet in America. But all of Longfellow's life wasn't wonderful. In fact, his first wife died during pregnancy. His second wife died when her dress caught on fire. And then in November of 1863, his son was serving in the Civil War and was severely injured. And so it's interesting that on Christmas Day of 1863, which is just a month after his son was injured in battle, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow sits down and he writes this poem that would become the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And it's an interesting song in that it traces the sound of the bells and how the sound of those bells uh, sort of stir Longfellow to consider what's around him and the faith that he seems to be grappling with in his heart. And so at the beginning of the song, there is a line that says, hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Wow, what a, what a line. And it certainly had to ring true in his life. He had to just abhor the war and the things that had caused the war and the injury to his son. At, at the time of this writing, he doesn't know if his son is going to survive. The song progresses and tries to come to grips with the evil that's in the world. And Longfellow has to struggle with his faith. But as the bells continue to toll in the song, Longfellow becomes more and more convinced that faith should win. And so listen to the end of the song. Then the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail and right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I have to wonder how he could write such a song in the midst of what he had been through. He shouldn't have hope but he does. He shouldn't be gracious, but he is. For Longfellow, love wins. Faith wins. Which, which brings us to the question, what would you do? Could you have done that? Could you have written those kinds of words? Could you have thought those kinds of thoughts? Could you have been that gracious? Well, think about it another, another way in terms of our scripture. If someone broke the trust that you had put in them, what would you do? If someone destroyed something that was precious to you, what would you do? If someone cheated and lied in order to take something from you, what would you do? Well, I think if, if you had uh, human DNA, you would be mad. You would want revenge. You would want retribution. You would want justice. So back to our story. Matthew is telling this story, and it's a story about God's grace and God's love. And Matthew wants us to understand that this grace and love of God is over the top. It's gracious. It's incredible. 
He wants us to get that and, and understand that because Matthew himself was a recipient of that kind of love. He's writing some years after Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, and he's trying to help put the pieces together of who God is and what God did and what he saw and what he witnessed and what he's heard and what he's seen. I, I hope that we uh, can get a glimpse of that today. The story in the 21st chapter of Matthew is about an incredible, unrealistic, over-the-top, gracious God who doesn't do what we would do, but does something we could never imagine. If you're watching this today with somebody, turn to him, turn to them and say, that's awesome. Or maybe if you're watching this by yourself, you could text somebody and say, wow, God's love is awesome. In Matthew 21, the writer seems to be saying that God shouldn't have hope. He shouldn't love us. He shouldn't care for us. We haven't earned it. You know, we, we, we think in terms of God's love as being transactional. We have to do something to earn God's love. And so a lot of us are really busy out there trying to do good deeds so that we'll please God so that God will be nice to us, care for us, love us. But it doesn't work that way at all. So let's walk through the, the 21st chapter pretty quickly. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is cleansing the temple uh, because he's had it with the tenants that are in the temple. A little while later, he's walking and he sees a fig tree that hasn't produced any fruit and he curses the fig tree and it withers up because it isn't doing what it's supposed to do. A little bit later, the authority of Jesus is questioned. People are asking, who are you to speak for God? What do you know? Where did you come from? How did you get in that position? Right before this parable is another parable about two sons who don't want to work. And then as we've read today, this parable of the tenants in the vineyard. The chapter, the 21st chapter, ends with the Pharisees so mad at Jesus because he knows, they know that Jesus is talking about them, that they're ready to wring his neck, but then they stop because they're afraid of the crowd. It's, it's not a great story at all. Uh, it, it's not the kind of news that we want to get. It's, it's not the picture we want painted of us, is it? Uh, that we misuse the resources that we have, that we're greedy, that we're manipulative, uh, that we take what isn't ours. It's not a great story at all, but it is the kind of story that you'd expect in 2020, isn't it? Just everything goes wrong, and how could folks act that way? But notice as we, we look at this, the passage, how it started uh, in the 33rd verse, 33rd and 34th verses, where the owner does incredible things for the tenants. Uh, the owner uh, plants the vineyard. The owner puts a fence around the vineyard. The owner digs the wine press. And the old owner builds the tower. The owner actually does everything for the tenants and then hands the tenants this property. We're tempted to say there's nothing else the owner could do. There's no more good to even be done. There's, there's nothing else the owner could do. There's nothing else that the tenants could want the owner to do. But then look at what we do. Look at how we respond to this gracious and wonderful gift. We killed the servants, and then the owner sends more servants. We kill them and beat them up. And then the owner sends his son, and it's a crazy story. The, the tenants think, oh my gosh, if we kill the son, then somehow we'll inherit the property? 
The thinking and the logic is, is so flawed, but it's typical of how our human minds work. Uh, God has given us so many wonderful things, and yet we take advantage, we lie, we cheat, we steal, uh, we do despicable things. And so the question in uh, verse 40 is what should the owner do? What would we do if we were the owner? What do you think the owner ought to do? Surely we're thinking the owner has had enough. The owner's had it up to here with these tenants. We, we could translate that into our time and, and say, surely God has had it up to here with us. You know, when we watch the news and when we look around us, we wonder how in the world does God still put up with us? So here's the thing. This is the thing that both endears us and terrifies us about God. God is the God of mercy and of holiness. God is the God of forgiveness and of judgment. God is the God of John 3.16, but also Revelation. God is the God of grace and law. God is the God of the found and the lost. God is the God of joy and sadness, sun and rain, hope and despair. God is the God of the servants in this story, but also the God of the tenants in this story. God is the God of the folks who've worked all day and also the ones that worked just the last hour. God is the God of saints and of sinners. You know, one of the things that's true about us is, is that we, we love mercy. We love to talk about mercy. We love to think about mercy when the subject of the mercy is us. Don't we? When we're, we're thinking about us and our relationship with God, we, we love to talk about forgiveness and mercy and grace. But when we talk about those folks, those folks that are different from us, those folks we don't quite understand, those folks, folks that, uh, that we see as troublemakers, then we love to talk about judgment and justice and how God is going to get folks that don't perform in the right sort of way. When the subject is them, we love to talk about judgment. When the subject is us, we love to talk about mercy. We don't, we don't want to think about our actions and our stuff much at all. We want to deflect that and say, well, we're not as bad as, as those folks. But we enjoy focusing on when other folks mess up. How can they live with themselves, we say? How can they think that? How can they act that way? What were they thinking? Weren't they brought up to act better than that? You know, I think in, in the, the story of, of the Bible and, and how we fit into that, that's why we aren't asked to be the judges. Um, I know that for, for some folks, that's, that's really bad news. Uh, what else are we going to do? How else are we going to spend our time if we can't judge? But our job is not to judge. That's not the task that God has given us. Our job is pretty simple. Love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. Don't worry, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye, but pay more attention to the log that's clouding your vision. You know, we started with a song, I Heard the Bells 
on Christmas Day. It's a, it's a great song and a great story behind the song, and it, it, it matches well with the scripture passage today to, to, uh, to kind of look at how uh, grace is something amazing. It's not what we expect. It's not what we would do. It's what God does, and it's how God looks at us in a caring, loving, compassionate, generous way. Uh, Faith wins out over all of the chaos of the world. So I'd like to close with another song that you may be familiar with. The, The title of the song is, It Is Well With My Soul. And it also has a story behind it. Horatio Spafford was the the writer, and a few months before he writes this song, his wife and children uh, are on a ship passage across the Atlantic. The boat sinks and the children die. And so the story goes, the legend goes, that as um, Mr. Spafford is sailing over... uh, the spot or the area where his children dies, he writes this song, It Is Well With My Soul. And he could have been angry, he could have been uh, uh, mad at God, he could have been cursing God. Why did you do this? Why did you take this from me? Uh, what have I ever done? What, what's wrong with you? But here's what he writes in the third verse of that song. My sin, <laughs> oh, the glorious thought, My sin, not in part, but the whole. It is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, it is well with my soul. Again, he could have easily been writing out of anger and bitterness, blaming those who were responsible for the death of his children, but he doesn't. He recognizes that all of us stand in the place that the Scripture says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the only thing that I can fix, the only thing that I can do is me. Maybe if I do a better job, maybe a more thorough job of doing the best that I can, the world and the whole will be a better place. Traditionally, the first Sunday in October is World Communion Sunday. It's a Sunday that's set aside where congregations and believers all over the world come together to celebrate our unity. Not the things that separate us, not the things that make us different, not the things that uh, we could point to that we don't like about different people in different places and different things, But what is it that draws us together? What is it that we have in common? What is it that helps us be a light to the world? For God so loved the world. Communion is about getting what we need and not what we deserve. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all like sheep have gone astray. We all have taken gifts and graces uh, that God has prepared and misused them. All of us owe a debt that we have no ability at all to pay. We don't improve our condition by pointing to someone else and saying, well, look what they did. They're a bigger sinner than we are. Because it's only by God's grace that we are saved. You know, at the end of the day, Jesus offers grace to both the tenants and the servants. At the end of the day, it's Jesus who offers grace to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Matthew wants us to know how amazing this is that God doesn't keep score. Matthew wants us to know also that it's God's grace. And because it's God's grace, God can do whatever God wants to do. It's not our grace. We don't own it. 
We don't dispense it. We don't manage it. We don't have veto power over who gets it. We are simply offered this gift. And it's grace. I hope on this World Communion Sunday, as we consider what it means to be part of a world community, that you would receive the grace that God is offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we stand humbly and amazed in your presence. Uh, your, gra- your grace is truly amazing. We know that we, ha- we haven't done so much that we deserve it, We haven't acted in such a way that grace is an award for all of the good things that we've done. We recognize, God, that it's simply a gift. So let us receive it. Let us embrace it. Let us use it. Let us hold it. Let us celebrate it for what it is. And let us be willing and able to celebrate with everyone, God, that you offer that same gift of grace too. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.